you to PrimePay's monthly broker webinar series on the first day of October 2014. Yes, it is indeed October if the leaves did not give it away. Uh, so welcome. We want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to sit with us here today. Uh, many of you are, uh, have been uh, with us for some time and have attended many of our webinars. And, and for those of you who are uh, first time, uh, we want to welcome you. And uh, my name is Steve Jackson. I'm the Senior Vice President. Um, of strategic development and channel sales here at PrimePay. And uh, we want to really do, truly, uh, welcome you to our webinar. You guys have a lot of competing schedules, and so we're thrilled to have you aboard. As you look at the title today, uh, for today's webinar, you see that the title is FSA, so Flexible Spending Account, Why Employers Love the Rollover in Complying with the NDT Requirement. Hmm, interesting. hearing some, some fall out there. Um, so, so some of you might be going, well, Steve, okay, FSAs, get that, um, you know, a rollover, I think I'm understanding what that's all about, NDT, non-discrimination testing, and you use the word love, Steve, <laughs> in the title? Yes, yes, it is, and I'm going to actually explain to you today why employers are truly loving the rollover provision for flexible spending plans and what they're truly doing here uh, with non-discrimination testing. Um, as most of you know, for those who have attended our webinars in the past, we uh, make every attempt to make these webinars practical. I would like for you to be able to take the information garnered here today and be able to go directly to your clients with this information. Um, ultimately, you need to be delivering value-added solutions to your clients, but you know what? Your employers are seeking advice from you, and so we want to try to help you with that task and really become that technical resource here today. Uh, let me just touch on um, one bit of um, kind of agenda aspects of our webinars. Um, for those of you who are attending here today, uh, we are recording the webinar, and uh, we will be able to provide you with a link of the recording. Uh, you will also receive a slide deck of the presentation, and there's always generally a couple different things that we might attach um, with that follow-up email of our webinar today. So um, also, in the GoToMeeting uh, menu bar, there is a chat or a question box. I would ask, as you have questions here throughout, if you would go ahead and type in your question, um, and I will do my best if I can uh, kind of attack those questions during the webinar. I will. Otherwise, we'll try to capture them at the end or certainly in a follow-up email uh, there with you uh, so that everyone has kind of a, all the frequently asked questions here for today. So let's go over the agenda. Uh, let me make sure my, there we go. All right, so let's look at the agenda here today. Some of you might be saying, well, I, I really need a greater expansive look at what the rollover is versus the grace period. I understand the grace period. It's been around a long time now. Um, but um, this new rollover provision, I need to understand how to best communicate this and really what are the advantages or disadvantages uh, to both. So we're going to cover that. Uh, the next is mid-year results. Um, what we're going to provide you today is really good information. We're going to provide you a national look at where or how much employers have adopted the rollover provision from a national focus. But then we're also going to provide you with prime pays results. I think you're going to want to hear about it, and then you're going to want to see how you stack up or your employers stack up with this specific rollover provision uh, being added. So we're going to look at mid-year results. Uh, we also then do need to look at a couple strategies for year-end planning around the rollover. So as employers who are thinking about adopting this maybe for the first time now, eh, yeah, you should just kind of go through a few strategies for some year-end planning. Okay. Um, next, we want to then dive into kind of this will dovetail into a discussion on non-discrimination testing and compliance. And, um, I'm going to go into some greater detail here in regard to NDT and what all that means. Um, but, but clearly, you're going to need to have a better understanding um, so that you can establish the criteria and the requirements with your employers. And, and that's really where I want to take it with you today, that the amount of audits that are now occurring uh, and, and are occurring and are being, uh, you know, these auditors are actually looking at non-discrimination tests now. It is very important that your employers have the results that they need for those specific audits that they may incur. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, the last thing is is really to show you where where, where Prime Pay has gone um, with this. Um, I think it, we would be remiss to actually not talk about our specific tool, um, the resources that we have available, actually to make it pretty easy for employers to fulfill that specific obligation with non-discrimination testing. So let's dive into it. Let's go right into here uh, kind of the FSA rollover comparison, some definitions, some trends. I think there's some really interesting pieces in this content uh, that will really help you as you talk with your client. So let's first, let's first look at a historical perspective. Okay, so if you were to really go back really far, right, so the late 70s, early 80s, so we've got a 30-year-old policy, and it was, it was enforced originally um, under a flexible spending plan, okay, and it forced employees to forfeit unused FSA funds at the end of a plan year. So, so in the early goings, if we were to go back to the early legislation around the use it or lose it rule, what Congress did not want is to create another deferred compensation vehicle where, the, where an employee could take this account and just it could just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and never be used, okay, or potentially never be used. And they felt that they did not want to create that such vehicle. We have 401ks for that. We have IRAs. We have other things um, in that capacity. And so, so, so it started off as a use it or lose it rule specifically around that whole deferred compensation basis. Let's not create another vehicle, another savings vehicle that they could, you know, just really grow and grow over decades. Now, really fast forward, in 2005, uh, we saw a major announcement uh, where the use it or lose it rule was modified to allow a two and a half month grace period following the plan year to spend their unused FSA funds. So what a welcome uh, piece of legislation and, and kind of expansion, at least, of that use it or lose it. I mean, everybody then had a two and a half month or up to a two and a half month period with which to spend down their dollars. Fantastic. Instead of having a 12 month plan year, I now have a, you know, a 14 month or a 14 and a half month uh, plan year. That is fantastic. Then, as ACA um, became uh, enacted uh, and instituted uh, as part of that legislation, that uh, it instituted a $2,500 limit on FSA contributions, which did effectively limit the potential for using health FSAs to defer compensation. So back to that original thought back, you know, 30 years ago, where, well, we don't want to have someone just have these dollars that are going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Now with ACA, we basically have a limit. Now we, we find our industry, we fought that limit, right? Don't impose the limit. Bad, 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 bad. But... Part of uh, lobbying efforts uh, to, to change the use it or lose it rule got traction because now there was a limit specifically imposed on that health FSA. So what happened was the IRS and Treasury began to solicit input um, to potentially modify the use it or lose it rule. And, and what they were looking at, a few different uh, types of um, of, I guess, inputs that had been uh, generated was, one, uh, let's do a rollover, so a true rollover, which is kind of like what we've seen, um, or let's at least make it be a cash out option, right? So the employee would be able to cash out of unused money at the end of the year. Well, what gained the most traction, <clears throat> the most traction on uh, the FSA as far as amending it was on the rollover. And so the new rollover provision was announced last Halloween, October 31st, 2013. So for some of you, I, I have used this, I think, once other, another time before, but, uh, uh, you know, as you think about it, I've done hundreds and hundreds of, of FSA enrollment meetings, and I think many of you on the call have probably done the same. And uh, so this is a little bit of a farce, right, but a little tongue-in-cheek. But uh, you know what? This was a huge objection. The use it or lose it rule, they were picketing outside. They were overturning my car. You know, I mean, it was a riot <laughs> because, hey, why do I want to contribute to this when I, uh, I could effectually, you know, lose it if I don't have the expenses incurred to, to really spend down those dollars? So with the FSA rollover provision, this has really allowed us to now have FSA enrollment meetings that are 
pretty spectacular, right? I mean, we've now created a, a more happy environment. So the rollover provision is such a positive message, and um, as you'll see in some of the numbers that I'll show you, some of the trends, uh, you are going to see that employers are adopting it, um, and that more employees are participating in it today more than ever. So let's look at some main points of the rollover provision, um, and I don't want to uh, belabor on any of these issues. Really, just want to hit some of the main points with you in regard to the uh, into the provision. Um, key things available. It is available now for all plan years. So unlike last October when the news was announced, uh, many employers could not make a change right away because they were already going through their open enrollment periods, let's say, or they were too close to the end of the year to really amend their plan um, to, to incorporate that FSA provision, the rollover provision. But do know this, is that it is available now. Employers, any plan year, you can adopt that rollover provision. So when you think about, okay, you have to adopt it, so what does that mean? The employer does need to amend their plan, include language that would state that they have adopted the rollover provision for their plan, okay? So it's really a, a document amendment that's going to be in order, and then effective communication to the employees to, to share what the provision is all about. The carryover uh, is up to $500 of unused health FSA amounts into the next plan year. So any dollar amount, so from a dollar up to $500, can be carried over or rolled over into the next plan year, okay, as part of the health FSA account. Anything unused above and beyond that $500 then will be forfeited. Okay, so if they're at $550 that was rolled over, $50 would be forfeited, okay, if there's no additional incurred claims from the previous year, okay, but only $500 or up to that amount can be rolled over into the subsequent year. Now, employers do have a choice, but they either need to choose to have the rollover provision or the grace period, not both. So they either are going to have the rollover for the health FSA or they're going to have the grace period for the health FSA, okay? The rollover amount also does not count against participant salary reduction limit. This was huge. Uh, what a fantastic, because um, originally there was a lot of discussion about this $500. Is it going to be included as part of the New Year's um, election? It's not the case. <clears throat> so if um, an employee has $500 that they roll over into the subsequent year, they could also elect up to the limit, $2,500, if that's allowed under their plan, um, and also have that $500. So they would have a maximum of $3,000 to spend in that next or new plan year. So that's fantastic. Now, they can't build it, right? So, so it can't just build and build and build and build. You can roll over only $500 each year. But now here's an opportunity where that employee can really, you know, they can look at their expenses, but know that, hey, I, I've got a little cushion here because at least $500 can be rolled over from year to year. <clears throat> the new provision would not permit an allowable election change for the current plan year. So just because, let's say an employer, an employer of yours would like to adopt, um, they'd like to adopt a, the rollover provision mid-year. Okay, so they're going to adopt it for their current 2014 plan year. You can do that. It's allowable. It's available now to do that. Um, but that doesn't give an employee, an individual, a participant, the ability to change their elections now just because they've added that amendment. So that's kind of a key point from an employee perspective. You know, once they've made their elections, but for some status events, you know, they're going to need to keep that election amount throughout the year. And then the last item here, you know, again, keeping in mind, this does not apply to dependent care accounts. Now, the dependent care account can still have the grace period, okay, all right, so that can be specific for the grace period, but the health FSA, the rollover provision is only available for the health FSA. So as I mentioned here, the employer must pick one. Uh, they must either pick the grace period or the rollover, <laughs> or neither, I suppose, if, if that'd be the case. So let's look at kind of this expanded comparison. The grace period, you get up to 75 days, two and a half months, right? So the, it's kind of a limited time, but it's not bad. 
a grace period has been a very welcome option um, for most FSA plans. Most employers today have adopted the grace period um, over all these years. The rollover, though, you can do up to $500, but now there's really no limit or duration, time duration there. They can roll it forward into that new year. So the grace period is 75 days, the rollover up to $500, and you can roll it all the way through the new year, okay? So as you're weighing the grace period versus the rollover, you know, let's, let's look at some advantages here. So since the rollover is capped at $500, the advantage does go to the grace period because there is no cap. In fact, uh, the employee who elected $2,000 for a plan year and at the end of the year they still have $2,000 sitting there, that $2,000 carry over into the grace period and then they could spend those dollars down at that time, okay? So no cap. So an advantage there to the grace period, depending on how much someone had uh, contributed. But the advantage goes to the rollover for the duration, all right? So now I, whatever rolls over up to $500 <laughs> is now available to me for that entire year. I have plenty of time to incur those expenses to spend down that $500. So it really comes down, as an employer is looking at a rollover or a grace period, really it's just a consideration for how it might impact the current year's plan. So they may not have adopted it. Let's say you had an employer that started January 1st, 2014, so the beginning of this calendar year. For whatever reason, they didn't adopt the rollover. Well, they might want to add that now to their plan. They can. They can amend their plan right now to incorporate that. Um, but they just need to understand. I mean, there needs to be communication now to the employees to, to at least explain that impact and so forth. But there really is no administrative impact uh, for employers in regard to um, making that change or that amendment uh, at this time or during, you know, in the middle of their plan year. Some things, again, just to kind of just to throw out there, if the employer selects the rollover option, well, what does that look like to the participant at the end of the plan year, <clears throat> okay? So we've been kind of accustomed to the grace period over time, but what does that look like to an employee? So um, let me just give you an example, and then I'll read what I have there on the slides. But as an example, the employee um, has $500 that they roll over into the new year. Okay, now there's a runout period, which is typically 60 or 90 days. So um, what that employee might have had incurred expenses in the previous plan year, okay, in which some of that $500 could go towards, all right? So, so let's just say they had $100 worth of incurred expenses in the previous year, and they need that $500, or part of it, need $100, uh, to be able to cover that. Okay, so they use that $100. If there's no other incurred expenses in the prior year, then the remaining amount, that $400, let's say, would be rolled over into the next year, and then would only be used for expenses incurred in that active plan year. So as it states there on your slide, you know, during the runout, the $500 rollover amount remains available for prior year dates of service. So as the runout occurs, they can still use incurred expenses in the previous year based on those dollars. But it also, that $500 could be used for the new year's dates of service. But then after the runout, the rollover amount should no longer be available for prior year dates of service. Okay, so just important note, I mean, we've been used to that grace period and the rollover. It, it, it's in essence, it works in a similar fashion, but it is a little different. <clears throat> All right, so I think what's really interesting is data, right? Uh, I think a lot of you like data. Um, we love it. Uh, it helps us with uh, many decisions, right? But, but one thing, is, it's a great assessment. All right, so what we wanted to do was try to get an idea of, well, all right, what are our employers doing, those employers that have active FSA plans? But even more than that, I mean, I, yes, it's great to know what PrimePay has been doing uh, and their clients, but nationally, what does it look like? Um, what does it look like? You know, or, or do we, as a comparison, is Prime Pay's clients doing worse, less? You know, what, what does it look like? So what we wanted to do was um, get a study nationally that would reflect employers who have had active enrollment 
in flexible spending plans, out of those FSA plans, those employers, what percentage of those employers adopted the rollover? And so what we've done is we've gone to our, we've got a great partner in Allegis Technologies. Um, they represent um, actually ooh, I, hundreds of thousands of employers across the country through, through hundreds of, of third-party administrators that provide this service. And what they did was they analyzed the data on their uh, FSA plans who had active enrollment in 2014, so at least up to date, kind of year to date, and they wanted to determine the extent of the current rollover adoption, but also its impact of the rollover adoption on the FSA enrollment and contributions. And what they found was, and I was kind of, uh, you know, it was very interesting to see that 8%, so nationally, 8% of those employers who had FSAs who then amended their plan to include the rollover provision, 8% of employers adopted the rollover provision. So in my mind, a very low amount, 92% of employers did not adopt the rollover provision for whatever reason, right? So as you think about your employers and why we bring this up is that many of your employers may not have positioned themselves in this way just yet and there could be a great conversation to have. Now let's look at the rollover adoptee growth relative to non-adoptees. So let's look at um, did we see a growth in number of participants? Did we see the average contribution increase and so forth? And what you see here is some nice numbers but they're not overwhelming numbers by any stretch. So what they saw was uh, a little over 1% of FSA enrollment growth. So if you put that in real numbers, if an employer had 100 participants last year in their FSA without the rollover, but when they adopted the rollover, they now have 101 participants. Eh, not a lot of growth there. Uh, contribution, if you were to look at the average, uh, if you look at the aggregate total contribution growth, okay, so, um, so it's showing here a little more than 3%. So if, if an employer had $100,000 in FSA contributions prior to the rollover, but then when they adopted the rollover, they now have $103,000 in contributions uh, that were provided. Very interesting, but still some very low numbers. And then the average FSA account election increased by a little more than 2%. Okay, so again, um, you know, the theory behind the rollover provision and what, what certainly prime pay promoted was, look, employer, by adopting the rollover provision, you're actually going to see an increase in participants, you're going to see an increase in contributions, which at the end of the day is going to be benefit you, employer, with FICA tax savings and your employees with, you know, all of the tax savings that they're going to realize. So let's now kind of take a look now because I wanted to look at what prime pay, what results have, have prime pay seen and what have our employers realized. So just so that you guys understand, prime pay took a very proactive role last fall in communicating the FSA rollover provision to our employer clients and participants. We decided that it was such a positive message that, um, and with most employers adopting a high deductible health plan of some sort, that these employees needed a vehicle to save even more money. And, and an FSA is still one of the most effective ways for an employee to do that. So our results were a little different. As we looked at our average results for our prime pay clients that have fully embraced the rollover, we have seen an adoption growth rate of 30%. So almost four times more than the national average. And, and I'll dive into it here in just a second, but a lot of that just goes to communication and education and really driving uh, resources for our employers, brokers, participants, so that they understand what this provision actually means uh, to them. So we saw a 30% employer rollover adoption rate. Then we get into the uh, contributions, and this is really where we saw some really, really good results. So we saw 17% FSA enrollment growth. The national average was just over 1%. Uh, 
All right, so that's, that's a huge increase. So if there were 100 employees participating in the FSA prior to the rollover provision being added, and now with it being added, there's now 117, okay? Now, what we also saw, as you see with the last kind of circle there, what we did also notice is that the average FSA contribution remained the same. Uh, we, it really was status quo. Uh, we didn't see employees deciding, well, hey, uh, now because of the rollover, I'm going to increase my election by $500. Yeah, we didn't see that. Actually, if anything, we saw it being exactly the same. So if you run that numbers, if we see 17% FSA enrollment growth, and the average account election is unchanged, then the uh, result would be that you'd see 17% FSA contribution growth. So that's huge. So we are thrilled with these results. Um, we are really focusing at driving more than 50% of our employers with FSAs to adopt uh, the uh, rollover here as we come into our next big renewal season, January 1 of 2015. And I expect that over the next two years, you know, you're going to see an adoption rate of more like two-thirds, three-quarters of employers will have moved towards that adoption. So understand that you know, many of you that are on the call here today, you've got uh, clients with us that have FSAs. Um, you know, with Prime Pay, what we hope that we're showing is that, you know what, we kind of know what we're doing. We can help really drive uh, the amount of contributions, which is going to save the employer a ton more in FICA savings, and certainly um, get greater satisfaction with employees who are enrolled. Um, over, the last, um, over the last month, we have been featured in Reuters, New York Times, Forbes, uh, businessinsurance.com um, in regard to our success that we've had um, with this FSA rollover provision and how we're working with our clients. So you might want to check us out. <clears throat> Some additional consumer research findings. This was a, um, a consumer research um, surveyed by Allegis Technologies. There were 1,005 consumers that were surveyed. Uh, the margin of error is around uh, plus or minus 3%, so very tight, very good findings. And they found out that of those not currently enrolled in FSAs today, so a, an individual, all right, who's not enrolled in an FSA, 43% of them indicate that they will be more likely to enroll in an FSA in the future due to the rollover provision being added. Very interesting. Of current FSA enrollees, okay, so individuals participating in an FSA today, 31% indicate they will be more likely to contribute a greater amount to an FSA with the rollover. Now, with our small amount of data that we see today, I don't, uh, you know, we don't, don't see that pan out like that right now, um, but clearly, um, at least the way the research was found, 31% feel that they would actually contribute more uh, overall. So there's some key messaging, right? Um, as we think about some, some strategies here that you may need to uh, think about as, as you're talking to your clients about the rollover provision, you want to be talking to them about, hey, where do you stack up? Why haven't you adopted it if, if they haven't? I mean, according to the national study right now, about 90, over 90 percent of employers haven't adopted the rollover provision. So it certainly starts with the discussion, right? I mean, just having the discussion with the employer, talking them through the benefits of the FSA rollover provision and how that will impact not only their employees, the number of participants, the number of contributions, but ultimately the tax savings that the employer would have. The big thing for us was educating the employer and employee. Um, we have, um, we're just finalizing a, a uh, uh, kind of a short video that explains what a FSA rollover uh, provides. It's a short little video that just helps an employee maybe understand what an FSA rollover, what does it mean <laughs> to them, uh, which is important. And the main thing is just understanding, um, you know, connecting with the employers so that they understand more um, Wow, what is the advantage to us, and, and, and how, how, what is it going to take for us to do it? It's a very simple process to um, administer. Um, as I mentioned before, it's simply amending their plan documents, incorporating that language. Uh, once they've amended the plan, uh, clearly uh, they will be able to uh, adopt the FSA rollover. So I would just ask, utilize some of our resources. We have um, several, many different rollover materials. The video, as I mentioned, we have uh, different employee announcements that we utilize today with our employers and employees and an FAQ that has been created. I um, mean, ultimately, the key messaging is that if an employer adopts a rollover with prime pay, 
you're going to see, on average, 17% more participants, which is going to equate to 17% more in contributions, which is going to absolutely equate to more tax savings for both you as the employer and the employee. What a great message. And I encourage you as a strategy here as we're getting into the, well, as we are into the fourth quarter, uh, that you begin talking to your clients more about this wonderful provision to their FSA plan. All right. All right. So as you know, um, as many of you know, Prime Pay has devoted quite a bit of time, energy, uh, financial resources behind compliance. Um, when when we, we I, I think I've mentioned this to you guys before. Um, you know, a study that we had done um, with our clients said that um, one of the top three business issues or challenges that employers are dealing with is maintaining compliance. And with um, you know, if anything, the Affordable Care Act has clearly put a target on more audits being generated. Why? Well, we need to raise revenue, right, <laughs> for the government and whatever it may be. Um, but you know what? There's many laws that have been on the books for decades that have not been adequately enforced. And so ACA has put this target on some key issues that, you know what, employers, you better start you know, kind of complying with some of these requirements, or you could get audited and you could fight, face some, some pretty serious penalties, okay? So, um, so what I want to share next here with you is we talked about an FSA. The employers need to test their plan for compliance is much greater today than it ever has been. Um, taking a kind of a pulse right now of kind of what we've seen with our current client base, but we've seen approximately about a 300% increase in the number of our clients who are getting audited today. Now you say, Steve, 300%, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big number, but it's coming off of a very small number, <laughs> all right? So be alarmed, but don't be so alarmed, okay? But, but what we are seeing is a trend. More employers are asking us for information about their plan so that they can show an auditor and, and go through the audit process. One of those areas that is being looked at more and more is non-discrimination testing. And some of you go, Steve, oh my word, non-discrimination testing? Really? You're talking about non-discrimination testing? Yeah, I'm talking about non-discrimination testing because these auditors are now asking for results. Employer, hey, um, you um, have this uh, flexible spending plan. Well, show me if you've passed the non-discrimination test. What employer cannot simply go, well, you know, I mean, come on, I, 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 of course I passed. <laughs> they're, they're going to have to show results. So let's just talk a little bit why NDT is so important. So certainly one of the first things is, it's required. You know, many of you have heard me talk about ERISA, right? ERISA is uh, something that's been in place for the last several decades. Um, but again, it's been one of those enforcement issues. It's not been enforced at least um, effectively um, over the last many years. But ACA has put kind of a target on ERISA, and if your employers are not following or complying with those requirements, they can face some serious penalties under ERISA. So the same thing here, non-discrimination testing or NDT, it is required. So it's not something that can be overlooked. I think many um, employers and, and maybe even you on the, on the phone here today, you know, on the webinar, maybe many of you go, all right, get the FSA established, get your premium only plan, get your HRA or Section 105 plan established. But, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, you're, you're giving consistent benefits. No, no reason to do, to do the test. It's not true. You need to do the test. It is required. And how best to prove that you've taken the test is if you have the results <laughs> when, when an audit is, is, is taken care of. So why it's also important, I mean, if we look at the crux of what non-discrimination testing is, it, it's meant to ensure equality. You know, we have these two definitions of employees. We have highly compensated employees. We have non-highly compensated employees. And, and the premise is, is that, you know, are the highly compensated employees receiving a greater benefit 
than the non-highly compensated. You know, so they want to ensure that the eligibility, the contributions, and the benefits are available to really all employees, but on a non-discriminatory basis. So in its most simplistic term, you know, non-discrimination testing looks after kind of the rank and file employees. It's not looking after the highly compensated employees, it's looking after the non-highly compensated employees. What's also very interesting as we think about ensuring equality and, and highly compensated employees, non-discrimination testing falls under Section 125, it falls under Section 105H, Section H, so 105H, and it also goes under Section 129, which is dependent care, right? So kind of some key focus areas here um, that you guys get involved with on a daily basis. But the definition of a highly compensated employee or individual is different <laughs> for every single one of those sections. There's no uniformity. So if an employer has a Section 125 plan and a Section 105 plan, listen, the, your highly compensated employee definitions are completely different for both of those. And so you will have to perform tests to reflect those specific targeted groups, those specific highly compensated um, individuals. So, so non-discrimination testing is, is in place to really ensure the equality uh, of those individuals. The third thing is really ultimately the high stakes, and I've tried to, I guess, put that FUD, that fear, uncertainty, doubt, <laughs> you know, in, in the mix here as I talk about non-discrimination testing, but it's true. You know, the failure of testing, if you do not do appropriate non-discrimination testing, it can result in fines and penalties. You know, and then, and so, so a plan can be disqualified, you can lose tax advantage status, and, you know, the, the result is really that solid documentation is key. You have to have or show or have the ability to show the results, you know, that, uh, I mean, in order to be able to have that employer truly comply with NDT, they're going to have to prove in an audit situation that they indeed passed those uh, tests. So you think about it. I think when... When a lot of you, uh, when we, you know, think about these different plans and these non-discrimination tests, I think, again, many of you and employers have felt that it's not really that important. But the IRS says, well, hold on a minute here. Okay, look, employer, I'm going to give you a vehicle for, for your employees and you to actually get some tax savings or tax deductions on these particular dollars, right? So the IRS said, okay, look, if I'm going to give you this vehicle, then I need you to follow my rules, right? So they've created this framework, this non-discrimination testing to ensure that there is some equality between the highly compensated employees and the non-highly compensated employees. <clears throat> so how is non-discrimination testing applied to your employer's plan? Now, I have... Um, specifically not wanted to go into crazy amount of detail on each of these tests, and I'm sure that I'm going to get a note here pretty soon that says, Steve, I would really like to get into some heavy detail <laughs> in how to do the calculations of these tests. We're not going to go there, maybe another day, um, but I do want to at least kind of showcase the tests that are required under a cafeteria plan, okay? So as you think about a cafeteria plan, you have a premium only plan, you have a health FSA, you have a dependent care account, okay, as part of your cafeteria plan. You know, the pre-tax premiums of the, of the plan for the medical premiums, the dental division, and so on and so forth. So you've got about seven tests, um, and as done separately, there's probably a total of nine, but, but these seven tests are, are the key tests. Um, that are needed and required for a cafeteria plan. And the first one is the eligibility test. And this is actually a three-part test to ensure that enough non-highly compensated employees are eligible to benefit from the cafeteria plan. So just simple definition for the eligibility test. The contributions and benefits test really wants to make sure that the highly compensated employees do not select more non-taxable or pre-tax benefits than do the non-highly compensated employees. The key employee concentration test 
we want to make sure that key employees do not receive more than 25% of the aggregate benefits offered through the cafeteria plan. Under the DCAP, now that's dependent care uh, test, the eligibility test uh, wants to ensure, very similar to the cafeteria plan eligibility test, ensures that a reasonable percentage of non-highly compensated employees are eligible to participate in the dependent care account. Under the contributions and benefits test, uh, we want to make sure that the um, highly compensated employees, that the number of eligible employees do not favor those who are highly compensated. And then we're also going to look at a greater than 5% owner's concentration test and also a 55% average benefits test. And so each one of these needs to be performed on um, for every cafeteria plan that you would have. So if we think about it in a scope of a, I would say, a standard FSA, right? So some an FSA or cafeteria plan that would have the premiums, would have the health FSA, would have the dependent care, kind of a complete cafeteria plan. Each one of these tests must be performed. Now I want you to think about this. Many of your employers, I mean, clearly, I mean, have do not necessarily get their FSA administration done by or provided by prime pay, you need to ask the question with your employers, so what specific tests does your provider of the FSA administration provide for? What do they do? What do they perform? Just to be known, many TPAs do not perform all of the tests. So a great discussion that you can have with your employer clients is, hey, look, you have an FSA, I want to make sure that you're complying, okay, just doing my due diligence with you. Do you have a results sheet? Do you have something that would actually spell out what tests your TPA is providing? And then lastly here on the self-insured. So there are actually, and underneath the eligibility tests and, and benefits tests, there's, there's three or four different kind of tests that go into the eligibility and benefits test. <clears throat> But again, the, the main emphasis of the eligibility and benefits test is to ensure that there is a reasonable percentage of non-highly compensated employees that are benefiting from the plan. And one big note to self-insured plans, and when I talk about self-insured plans, I'm including this, this test includes health FSAs and HRA plans. And you say, Steve, Steve, you've missed, uh, I think you misspoke there, you say health FSA. Well, um, you know, ACA has defined a health FSA, and it's been defined before, but kind of put a target on it. A health FSA is considered a group health plan, and HRA is considered a group health plan. And so, therefore, would flow under Section 105 in regard to the non-discrimination test, so under 105H. So very important, um, you know, even a standard HRA where maybe some employers or maybe you even in the past have gone, well, look, we're providing the benefit, it, it looks like we're being consistent kind of across the entire scope, um, and, uh, you know, so we're going to be fine. Okay, maybe by just looking at the plan, you're fine. But again, in an audit situation, how can that employer prove that they indeed passed that test? So when must your employer's plan be passing? Well, the requirement is that your employer's plan must be passing as of the last day of the plan year. Um, so, you know, we make some recommendations as of best practice. Well, it would be good to perform the test mid-year because if you have some drastic changes that need to be made um, or revisions to highly compensated employees or non-highly, that gives you plenty of time to make that change. But certainly best practice would be a mid-year to an end of the year. You don't want to make the, the um, test done too close to the end of the year because you do want to allow enough time um, to either make changes through payroll um, so that everything is handled correctly and quickly by the end of the specific plan or tax, well, by the end of the plan year. So corrections can be made during the plan year, but not after the plan year. So, um, you know, as you think about when a plan fails, and we clearly have plans that fail, you know, during the plan year, corrections may be made, um, elections for highly compensated employees may be reduced so that the plan passes, so on and so forth. After the plan year, though, corrections may not be made. 
<clears throat> the tax-free treatment of the benefits can be lost, and those salary reductions for the highly compensated employees can be treated as taxable income. So it's much better to take a proactive stance in, in really managing the testing in the current plan year so that you can actually make all the corrective actions actually right, right away. <clears throat> so, prime pay has responded. Um, you know, compliance, as I had mentioned before, is really a top three business issue or challenge for your employers. Uh, you know, in a survey that we, we did with you guys at the beginning of this year, you mentioned that really compliance, just <clears throat> helping your clients mitigate risk is a, is a key issue. Uh, that you want to try to solve. And, and so PrimePay has really looked at this, and as we begin to see the audits really come in and, and an increase in those audits with our clients in 2014, um, PrimePay has decided to take a strong commitment towards compliance. Um, we felt that our, our <clears throat> the traditional way of us handling the testing, although effective, was, was not not efficient enough, not, uh, not providing the results that we wanted to give the employer so that the employer in any audit won't have to do anything but provide the results page and, and, and show that their plan has passed. So what I wanted to just share is kind of some things that we, what we've done uh, in regard to a, our non-discrimination testing solution to ensure your employer is compliant. And, and we've done a major overhaul. We've, we've spent actually a lot of, a lot of dollars, financial resources, expertise around this area to really ensure that, that your employer is compliant through it all, but, but also hopefully make it easy uh, for them to, to be compliant. So one of the things that we did um, that is very important <clears throat> is we upgraded the technology. Um, in prior years, and the way that we had handled this before was very much more manual, okay, in nature. And we now have um, given the ability to drive employers through a portal, so it's protected, employee private information is protected. In a lot of the non-discrimination testing data, it requires, you know, private information, such as date of birth and, and compensation information. So it was important for us to really ensure that we're protecting all of the employee private information that would be running through the specific test. <clears throat> What we've also done then is really improved the process. Before, as I would mentioned, it was kind of a manual process. Well, we've now improved the process so it really reduces the client confusion for each test. <laughs> we just have simply now, instead of requesting some specific data for each one of the tests, we now just want the data, and that employer just simply needs to provide all of the major data points that is needed, and then those tests are automatically run. So the employer doesn't have to need to know, well, hey, this is for the dependent care tests, this is for my premiums, you know, my pre-tax premiums, or this is for my health FSA. They no longer need to, um, uh, to have that information. <clears throat> so much improved process. The big one for me was the results report. Uh, to be able to generate an official, uh, comprehensive, formal non-discrimination testing results report um, was critical for our clients and for PrimePay. This report can be provided for complete audit backup. So as your employers go through any type of a, an IRS audit, uh, Department of Labor audits, and in these kind of situations, we can provide, and certainly they will already have in their hands, the report based on their previous plan year and whether they have passed um, or not. So very, very positive to have this comprehensive report. <clears throat> What I also want to mention is that we are performing all required non-discrimination testing um, for each plan. We are not skipping a step. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there are many there are many providers out there performing FSA administration where they're performing a test, but they're not performing all of the tests. And that's where I would ask you to reach out to your clients and determine, hey, client, I mean, show me the results of, of what has been performed. Um, if you're not seeing all of those tests being performed, then, you know, you know that, that there are some steps that are being skipped. Here at PrimePay, we're performing all required NDT tests for each plan. 
quantitative corrective action. So one of the biggest areas of non-discrimination testing is certainly the results, right? But when the results are fail, um, they need to know what to do next. So how am I supposed to handle this with my highly compensated employees? What am I supposed to do for adjustments for non-highly compensated employees? So under our new process, we actually are going to provide real practical uh, corrective actions and let the employer know, okay, if you do this, if you make these corrections for the highly compensated uh, deductions or elections and or make these adjustments for the non-highly uh, compensated uh, elections, you will pass. So, you know, there are some fantastic corrective actions that we will provide um, to the employer once they have completed uh, that test. Another big area for us, too, since we've made this commitment to compliance, was to provide more frequent um, kind of and proactive communication to our clients. So for those of you who have clients with our FSAs, um, in the, in the, starting in the middle of the plan year, we will begin to send out emails, um, and there's only three, so just three kind of steps. But three reminders that will go out. Uh, we also, uh, their dedicated um, client success specialist will also be talking to them about that, uh, about our NDT testing at that time as well. But we're going to provide more frequent kind of proactive communication to our clients so that they just know, hey, look, I mean, we can't force them to, to have us run the test. Uh, clearly. Um, but we definitely want to get the information out to them so they know, look, we're going to make it easy. If you can provide us with the information, we can go ahead and run that test for you, you know, whenever you're ready. And uh, so very, uh, very proactive um, communication. So creating best strategies with your clients. Um, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to communicate this, right? It's all about communication, communication and education here uh, to your clients. So what I wanted to do was just kind of bring together a few ideas um, that you could take with you here today. I don't expect you to remember all of the tests, right? Well, this test does this, this test does that. The main thing is getting an overall message, right? Uh, driving some, some good strategies, best strategies for the best results. So. One of the first things you can start with is just asking your client the simple question, hey, you have an FSA. Hey, did you adopt the rollover provision for your FSA? You know, great starting communication. And do know then that the rollover provision can be made at any time. And, you know, communication would be best when it's before or, you know, right at the start of the open enrollment. I mean, you want to give the employees enough information so that they can make their the best decisions, right, as they go, as they make their elections for the new year. So the earlier you can start to have that conversation with your clients certainly is going to be, you know, the best. The talk track. Um, what prime pay? Well, certainly Nash, the national average is seen, but, but prime pay can certainly say that we've seen a, a 30, uh, I'm sorry, a 17% increase in participation. We've seen a 17% increase in the total amount of contributions. And so we're seeing that our employers are saving more FICA tax savings. We're seeing employees that are more satisfied um, and saving a lot more in taxes as well. So kind of an easy talk track, right? There's your talking points. <laughs> well, employer, if you adopt the rollover, you're probably going to see an increase in participation, contribution, so on and so forth. So a great uh, talk track uh, there in regard to that. So education is critical. Uh, for those of you who are utilizing Prime Pay and our administration services and our, your employers are, we'd love for you guys to take advantage of some of our resources and uh, you know certainly connect with the uh, client success specialist, the dedicated rep for your accounts, uh, for your clients' accounts, and we can get you directed, get you information that you need uh, to drive that education. But it is critical. You've got to get the word out. So also, big message as far as a talking strategy with your clients is compliance is actually huge. Please do not just kind of push non-discrimination testing aside for your health FSA. For your HRA, compliance is huge. I mean, the latest talk track, and I've heard a lot of different numbers, but, um, you know, 
so I, I didn't put any numbers, but just put some, you know, what the trend is. The IRS is absolutely hiring thousands of agents. I don't know what that number looks like, but I've heard some crazy numbers, but um, they're hiring thousands. Department of Labor is doing the same thing. They're hiring, uh, they say, a thousand or more to enforce ERISA audits alone. So compliance is huge. Um, is the chance of an audit um, still really high on the radar for every client of yours? No, no absolutely not. I mean, that would be a, a lie, you know, if I said that. However, the increase of audits are absolutely occurring. So it's a great talk track with your employer just to say, look, it's going to happen eventually. I don't know when. It's not a if, it's when, right? So compliance is huge. Talk to your clients about that. And one of the quick ways that you can, you can figure out whether they've done their test recently is, do you have results? And have you performed all the necessary tests? Very, very important questions um, to, to ask. All right? So great strategies. I mean, you know, a lot of this comes down to communication, but it's also your education and understanding how the FSA rollover works so that you can communicate that, um, you know, effectively to your employer, whether they choose it or not. What a great talking track and discussion that you can have with your clients in regard to that, in regard to that specific strategy. When you're talking about non-discrimination testing, listen, ultimately, maybe it costs the employer money to perform a test, right? I mean, you got to have an FSA, you're going to perform a test. I mean, it's going to cost something to do that, but that's going to pale in comparison to the penalties that can come into play in regard to not performing those tests like you need to. All right? So some important things to, to consider. Uh, I, I want to just touch on maybe a couple questions um, that I saw um, that had come up here for today. One of the questions that was asked, and uh, Sandra, I really appreciate it, do all the tests satisfy compliance for all retirement plans and health plans? So the answer there is no. So as you think about 401k retirement plan uh, testing, they call it some ADP testing or heavy testing, that is a different component, a different test specifically for pension benefits. So the testing that I'm recommending today is based on more health and welfare benefit plans that are utilizing Section 125 plans and Section 105 plans, uh, like I had mentioned. But this is not having to do uh, in regard to retirement plans. So great question. I did want to at least uh, affirm that uh, on that. So thank you for that. Um, Let's see here. Let's see if there's any other question. <clears throat> All right. So one of the questions, great question. Gary, thank you for asking this. So let's, we have this rollover provision. The employer has adopted it for their plan, and they have an employee that has, um, you know, they're rolling over $500 in this year. And the question that Gary is posing is, well, okay, in three years, does that $500 roll into $1,000 in year two, and then roll into 1500 in year three, and so on and so forth? The answer is no. So the maximum amount of unused funds that can be rolled over from year, from plan year to plan year, is 500. So kind of going back to my original slide, what the IRS did not want is another vehicle <laughs> where an employee can just pack money away you know, as in some kind of a deferred compensation type of, a, of an account or vehicle. And so the max is 500 So I guess if you were to just, in theory, let's say if the $2,500 limit is, um, you know, staying the same, if it were to remain static from now on, and, and it's not, but, but let's say it does, the maximum that an employee would have if they elected 2500 and they rolled over 500 would be 3000 each and every year. Okay, but you can't keep building on that rollover account. So um, I think at least for right now, with some of the questions that we have in the time, um, I, you know, I think we covered what we needed to. I, I trust that you can gain some real practical um, kind of knowledge with the information that was shared today. Um, I, I really appreciate the time that you have taken. Uh, look for the follow-up email to be coming to you shortly, which will have the recording link, uh, the, the uh, presentation, the slide presentation or slide deck of the presentation, and a couple other things that will 
we'll put in place there for you um, so that you have. But we really appreciate you attending the webcast today. Um, our next webcast will be the first Wednesday of November, and we truly look forward to talking to you then. So with that, that will conclude our webinar for today. Have a great day and a wonderful October. Take care.